Hi, I'm David Radcliffe, a member of the Committee for Writers with Disabilities at the Writers Guild of America West. I am a skinny white guy wearing a long sleeve blue and gray striped shirt and headphones, and I'm seated on a white couch. We're very proud to bring you Film Independent Presents, a Disability Inclusion Showcase, marking the premiere of the 2020 Media Access Awards presented by Easter Seals. We send our thanks to the Media Access Awards and to Easter Seals for making this showcase possible. And thank you to the Hollywood Foreign Press Association, which is the lead sponsor of Film Independent Presents. We send additional enthusiastic thanks to our screening partner, Vision Media. I'm here for a conversation with Lauren Ridloff, a Tony Award nominated actor who now plays Connie on the hit AMC series, The Walking Dead. This year, Lauren is celebrated at the Media Access Awards as a recipient of the SAG-AFTRA Harold Russell Award for changing perceptions of disability on screen. Before we jump into conversation, I'll let Lauren describe herself for our audience. Hi everyone, that was such a great introduction. I'm Lauren Ridloff. I am a brown skinned woman. I am sitting with a white brick background. Um, I've got curly black hair that's up in a bun. Um, and I'm using, I'm wearing a loose black blouse. And Carrie, do you want to introduce yourself as well as ASL interpreter? Yeah, I'm Carrie. I'm the sign language interpreter. I'm wearing a black shirt and I just have a gray background. My hair is brown and it's just back in a ponytail. Great. Nice to meet you both. Um, so Lauren, I'm excited for you. Congratulations on your Media Access Award. Congratulations on being a Tony nominee. Uh, your bio is super impressive, so I have a lot of questions. Um, how does this most recent honor compare to being both a Tony nominee and uh, the winner of Miss Deaf America? You mean Miss, the, well, the Miss Deaf America Award? That was a while ago. It feels like a lifetime ago. <laughs> I, I mean, Miss Deaf America, winning that crown, that title, I feel like that helped me prepare for something like this. That was focused on you know, interacting with people, answering questions, and, you know, pretty much being um, a representative of the deaf community. And I feel like that I'm doing it again now. Whenever I had gotten the Tony nomination, that meant, you know, that I had a bigger platform. There were more people that I could interact with and that I could present my face more. And then by being presented, you know, it was, a way to normalize deaf access, to normalize sign language. And then now with this recent nomination and um, BAFTA, that's a breakthrough award, um, the, MM, the MAA award, it's a lot. I am thrilled and I'm, I'm hopeful that I can continue moving and striving for change. Um, the first time I had been introduced in a space as an advocate, I actually felt really uncomfortable because I'm just trying to do good work. Um, so there is that additional level of responsibility that's imposed on you by others to be an advocate for a whole community. Um, how have you come to terms with that or have you, or do you feel like it's more important to just be recognized for the work itself? Do you feel a particular obligation to represent women in a particular way or deaf people in a particular way? Yes, that definitely comes with having a platform. I remember growing up, my, my mother would say, you are going to be an advocate, period. Even though at that time, I was eight or nine, 10 maybe, I was really quiet. I was a shy kid. I preferred to stand behind things, behind people. I was really a wallflower. And I couldn't imagine getting up onto a stage, being a spokesperson, speaking for somebody else, representing some, someone else. That seemed like a concept that was so far away. And over the years, uh, when I became a professor, I did teach children with a variety of backgrounds. Some of them could hear 
um, they were just in the local area who came to our school because their parents wanted them to add another language while just being in general classes throughout the day. I taught students who their parents were deaf and then them, they, they could hear themselves, the kid, but um, it, their natural language was sign language. Um, I taught deaf students, but I mean, it was a very general, you know, population of kids, six or seven. Um, was their age and from kindergarten to third grade and I found myself acting as an advocate for them in many different ways, not just related with um, the deaf community, but many different cultural isms. I mean, they were, a lot of them were New York kids. A lot of them came from Dominican Republic, Republic, Puerto Rico, um, Africa, um, Hispanic, you know, when we all looked the same. And I feel like I fell into that. And then when I really start diving in, um, when I really started diving into Children of a Lesser God on Broadway, I really started to realize when I first started acting, um, I was Sarah Norman and I had a really hard time incorporating and embracing her character and who she was. I felt almost ashamed to be a character like Sarah Norman because she lacked eloquence. She didn't have a like gentle way of <laughs> saying anything. She was so tough and straightforward and she was pretty hurtful and she was a very angry character. But that's what that's what I had thought of her in the beginning. And then as I started to play her, um, the process of, you know, going deeper into the character and talking with um, a manager, I realized, the stage manager, I realized that Sarah, Sarah Norman was part of the, sorry, she was part of the 98%. Um, she was part of the 98% of the deaf population that um, experiences language deprivation. And wow. I'm a part of the other 2%. I did not experience language deprivation. I did have access to language and communication ever since I was a little kid. And so for people that aren't aware, the biggest obstacle to having hearing loss is not having access to language. And there are many deaf children with hearing loss who grow up with little to no language their whole lives. 98% of them, 98% of deaf children grow up without language. And Sarah Norman, she was just a typical deaf example. And so that really was what struck me. And I realized that I now have this platform and a responsibility, and I would like to say a civic cultural responsibility to advocate for that 98% of the population of deaf people who do experience language deprivation. And to be able to show that character, Sarah Norman, to be able to, you know, give her the respect that she deserved, that changed my perspective. And now I'm very proud. Um, and I feel more clear about what I need to do going forward. Um, that gulf that you mentioned between Sarah and yourself is interesting to me because sometimes what we hear in the disability community, um, I'm a wheelchair user for context, is, you know, well, if you can't, th this is what people without disabilities say. If you cast someone in a wheelchair who actually uses a wheelchair, then, you know, then that's not as big as an acting challenge as if you cast Daniel Day-Lewis, so he plays cerebral palsy. But what you're describing here is a, is a wide range of experience between your experience as a deaf person and, and Sarah Norman's experience as a deaf person, culturally, um, educationally, and everything else. So how do we send that message to casting directors, to audiences, to potential employers in any industry that disabilities are not homogenous? And my experience as someone with cerebral palsy is different from someone else's with cerebral palsy. Your experience as a deaf woman is different from someone else as a deaf woman. How do we clarify and make that message accessible to people? Through the media, we need more stories that do include people who do have disabilities. We need more stories on TV and film, on stage. We need more characters and books. 
I mean, any form of medium, any medium. We feel like as society, I mean, we really do rely on the power of story, storytelling. So de developing a form that we believe in, our opinion, our thoughts, our ideolo ideologies, our ideas about different groups of people. So while people with disabilities are kind of invisible, they're not really shown on the screen. I mean, it's like you're saying, we, it's like a catch-all. You know, you see one and then it's a catch-all. Oh, we have a person with disabilities. They're right here, they're in this show, check. And that covers everybody, people think. And then that character becomes like the general assumption for everybody. And I feel like we have so many, many, many talented people with disabilities. And I mean, maybe I'm biased, but I, I think that deaf people rely so much on facial expressions and body language and being aware of their space and their surroundings. They're natural actors. They're so naturally talented. But the problem isn't in finding the skills. The problem is finding an authentic story to tell and having that opportunity. And there's not an, enough story developers out there. And I feel like right now, especially during this pandemic, the audience, the people at home, I think they're ready for their for these stories, don't you think? Oh, definitely. I hope so. I, I feel that way. Um, and also, I think the range of the characters that you've played between Children of a Lesser God and The Walking Dead, I mean, those are those could not be more diff different experiences, I'm assuming, production-wise, um, moving from theater to television and doing your upcoming series for Marvel. So you yourself seem to be really embracing this idea that, you know, it's best to do everything at once and just show people the variety of opportunities there. Yes, that is the thing I love about The Walking Dead is being, is that it has two deaf characters right now. Um, and they're on the spectrum. There is a deaf woman, my character, Connie, who seems to be, has been deaf for a long time, maybe born deaf, and it's just her way of life. She has never experienced any kind of loss. She hasn't had to go through any period of adjustments. And then while the other character on the screen, Kelly, her young, Connie's younger sister, um, she did have to go through a really painful experience of hearing loss. And she, you know, became a deaf person and she's had to learn how to deal with that new hearing loss. She doesn't know where to look. She doesn't know how to rely on visual cues and it has really kind of destroyed her. And I love The Walking Dead and that they were able to take advantage of that opportunity to show two different experiences, two different individuals. So I think that that's the thing that we need to see more of, not just one deaf person or not just one disabled person on the screen. We need a few just so that people can have that opportunity to see and compare experiences and realize that people are different. People are actually different from one another. Yeah. What's, um, what was your experience like coming into a, a hit series in, in deep into its into its existence, like nine seasons in, um, joining a, a cast that had largely been established, a crew that had been working together for years, and maybe also, you know, I've worked in network TV too, or, well, that's not network, but I've worked in TV too, and sometimes there are things that we have to ask for or navigate that other people aren't thinking of. So what was it like coming into that experience, you know, as the new kid and also having to, you know, um, advocate for yourself and for others in that new space. That is a really good question. How do I advocate for myself? How did I, being the new kid, um, actually being the new kid, not just on that set, but in the industry, it was a challenging first few years for me trying to figure out what is needed and what is wanted. 
my number one fear, to be honest with you, is to ask for too much. I never want to ask for too much. And then yeah. people with that impression of, oh my gosh, it's too much trouble. It's not worth it. But at the same time, I'm like, no, I have certain needs in order for me to deliver. And so that's always a challenge that I'm facing every day on set, just that feeling. And with The Walking Dead, I'm really proud of them. The crew, the people that are working on The Walking Dead, I mean, it's a family, really. They have been together for many years. They are established. They are very, they've got a strong relationship. So when I went in, they were very open-minded right away. They didn't know much, but they were very open. And so the first day um, I had an assigned interpreter, it was just one, which um, just for your guys' information, you'll always see um, on stage, like a crew will usually have three or four people, right? Like even a cameraman has like three or four people because it's tough. It's tough working on set and like actors have, you know, settings and there's so many things. And so for me to have one interpreter working for me all day on set, there's no way that interpreter is going to be exhausted. And then the second thing is the interpreter that they brought in um, then there was no way, there was no other person to make sure that that interpreter was qualified. So we didn't know if that interpreter yeah. had any type of skills or if they were qualified. I mean, she was cool. She was nice. And then they hired her on, but I mean, who knows if she's certified or they just brought her in. So right away, I had to ask for a second interpreter and I had to have a team for this type of job, this type of setting. And my character does take a lot of space in the story. And so I did need a lot of support. And the interpreters were also working. There's an interpreter that had to work with the directors to watch the signing on the screen, and then also an interpreter working with me. And so we've all kind of just been learning on the job. And so from the beginning to today, now I have four interpreters and I have an ASL consultant. And The Walking Dead is amazing. They have learned and just taken the ball and they've improved every year. And now The Walking Dead is able to share that information with other production companies who have reached out to them whenever they first hired, hired me. It's been great. That's so awesome. That's really exciting. Um, and I think since we're doing this as an intersection between Media Access Awards, which is a disability organization and Film Independent, which has a lot of independent filmmakers watching. I think that's an exciting thing to think about, maybe to help answer some questions about if someone wants to incorporate stories and, and characters and actors who are deaf in their work, how can they do that if they don't have, you know, like, like what's, what's, the, what's the proper way to go about making that possible and equitable um, for people, let's say, if you don't have much of a budget, if you can't hire multiple interpreters? Well, first of all, I don't think that that's a budget issue. Most of the time, based on my experience, it's it's a in hindsight. Um, in mm -hmm. hindsight, it really pays off. Like for example, um, in pre in pre production planning, if they just plan for two interpreters in pre production, two interpreters, that's not going to be a problem. I really feel like it's just the same as them planning for four makeup artists. Yeah. Or, you know, once you set up it, once you set everything up from the beginning, if you can get everything in the pre production stage, it's fine. It all rolls through. And then the second thing is that I think many people are starting to think, um, what do we do? Oh, we'll just bring in a person that signs. Mm. And we need to figure out what the best way is to show that on screen. Do we need to have the deaf person with subtitles on the screen or the deaf person with a voiceover on the screen? And so I think that that's a really interesting path that we're going through right now. Um, the movie Parasite, did you see that foreign film? It just- Oh out. yeah, four times. <laughs> Yes, four times. <laughs> I only saw it once, um, but that's because I have kids. 
Um, <laughs> it was a good movie. It was so great, right? Um, so Parasite was subtitled and it's a foreign film. And I really feel like that is a really big breakthrough for the signing community to have things subtitled. And so I think that's a great thing for people to start thinking about. And actors who work with other deaf actors, meaning their characters, it's interesting to see how the characters interact together. Will the characters sign to each other? Who will teach the actor sign language? Will it be the deaf actor that will teach the other actor sign language? Mm. No. And so that's where it's cool to bring in an ASL consultant and they're really vital in those types of productions. And a lot of us aren't aware of those types of positions, an ASL consultant. And that would be the same as an accent or a dialect coach. You, I mean, people are used to pulling in an accent or a dialect coach to help with speaking, to make sure that enunciations are clear, or if that character is going to use a specific accent. It's the same thing with an ASL consultant. They can come in, teach the character or the actor sign language for their character and help the actor, you know, find a specific level of fluency. Will that character be fluent in ASL? Will they be a beginner? And that's a that's the ASL consultant's job to help the actor find, you know, what their character is supposed to look like. And then also to look and watch while the film is being um, shot, what the tone is, how that's being presented. So having an ASL consultant is such a vital job. It's so important. And it's often um, a job that a lot of people in the industry don't know about. And I think that's a great point about building it in at the foundation building accessibility and equity in at the foundation rather than trying to retrofit it once you know you, you move the project in a particular direction. And we think about that with um, accessibility of buildings for people with mobility disabilities. Often the, the accommodation becomes kind of, kind of janky, kind of unsafe because they, they built it in later rather than thinking about it from the start, which actually saves time and money and effort. Um, I definitely want to ask you about your your Marvel project because everybody's curious and I, but I also know that Marvel makes everybody keep so much secret. So is there anything that you can share with us about your upcoming Marvel experience? Is it is it in production? Is it affected by COVID? <laughs> really, I can't say anything. I understand. I, I had to ask. I can't wait for it to come out. It is going to come out next November. It's going to be awesome. It was so much fun. That's all I can say. Got it. Um, I also wanted to ask you about your breaking in, basically, because it's such a it's such an awesome breaking in experience. Because from what I can gather, you were sort of in a different direction professionally. You were teaching. You have a master's in education. You mentioned that you taught kindergarten students. Um, and then you got into Children of a Lesser God and you got a Tony nomination and now it's, you know, a rocket ship for you. So can you talk a little bit about your, your previous, your, your life before acting and, and what skills you developed in that space that you can carry over into your professional life now? <laughs> really? I've been doing the same thing. The only difference is my classroom is now a global mm -hmm. room. And the age spectrum that I teach is a huge variety from babies to who knows what. But people often ask me if I miss teaching. And no, because I'm still teaching. One of my favorite things, one of my favorite things as a teacher was to um, read books and interpret them to sign language. And I always couldn't wait until that time of day. Um, time for reading, time for signing the book. And so when we would get the book out, I would get into that character, we would put on the characters of the book and really, in a sense, act them out. And in a way that really did help to me to prepare for jobs like this. And I still do the same thing every day. I, I put that character on. I engage audiences and my intention is to empower people that are like me and to teach those who are new to my world. Well, I feel like a lot of skills developed with 
teaching kindergartners would transfer well into working with Hollywood executives or, you know, any sorts of personalities in the industry, um, maybe in theater and film and, and elsewhere. What, what sort of uh, roles would you like to see more of in the future for yourself or for, for other underrepresented actors? Like what's a dream project for you? I don't know if you know this, it's a little bit crazy, but during the Broadway play, Child of a Lesser God, I did a, I did an interview and also somebody had asked me the exact same question and I just threw out kind of jokingly, really in the most jokeful manner that I wanted to play a superhero and now it's happening. And so, so you're done. Now, wait, now what should I say? I feel like I have to have <laughs> a dream. You've already you've already made it. You're done. You can you can you can rest now. You you've lived your dream. You've lived several people's dreams. <laughs> yeah. I but do, actually, oh. I would love to be involved with a romantic comedy, a rom com. And I'm not, I mean, we don't see that much out there, you know, people with disabilities, deaf people playing characters that have a romantic connection with somebody else. I'd like to see a rom-com. And my original dream was to write a book. Um, and so that's exactly why I had become a teacher in the first place was because I wanted to understand children better. I wanted to understand how their minds worked, what captured them, and so I think that's a dream that I haven't achieved yet, writing a book. That sounds great. Um, I have one question, one quick question for you as we wrap up. It came to me this morning from a friend who is deaf and who works on the development side of the industry. She was very excited that we're speaking. Um, so I wrote it down, just a second. Um, she says, I've been having recent discussions on how to impactfully make a difference in the industry because I've realized that opportunities for access for talent relies mostly on producers and showrunners. I'd be curious to know how Lauren was cast in The Walking Dead and who had the influence to have her be in the show and how can we continue that momentum from the top? That is one of the biggest reasons. Um, one of the biggest, biggest reasons that I did get the role was just via um, visibility. The agency had gotten in touch with me and asked if I wanted to audition for that role. Um, I sent out a film a few days later that I would be cast. Or I sent out a film auditioning and then I got a notification a few days later so that, saying that I would be Connie. Um, I think it just worked out in time. I was really fortunate. But I guess, how do we push for change? Um, you know, a little bit every day. I used to say, you know, as a kindergarten teacher, I found that most students, whenever they would make a mistake, it wasn't an, an intentional mistake. They were just learning. We're learning and we learn by the way of making mistakes. And I think that, you know, parallels for Hollywood executives and people all over the world we're all learning. And I think that Hollywood does sense that it's time for TV and film to look more like the world. And I really do feel like everybody is ready, but maybe we're just not sure how or what the first step should look like. And I think that's where it's heavy and we've got a lot of, we got to do a lot of the heavy work now. We have to be patient, be understanding, show a lot of empathy, but then teach and teach again and again. Do you think that there are particular positives or opportunities that come out of this new normal of COVID and access through Skype, Zoom, all that sort of thing? It, se it seems like we're in a unique space now to kind of reimagine how the industry works. And I'm wondering if that has any re uh, resonance to you within the deaf community. I'm also thinking on the alternatively on the other side, a lot of people are wearing masks right now and that's gotta be difficult for 
lip reading purposes. Yes, it is so hard for lip reading, so hard for facial expressions. I can't recognize people. I feel like there's a lack of emotions. It's so hard to know in general without masks. It's hard for me to know if somebody is talking to me. Usually I'm able to use my eyes. I can see if um, somebody is approaching me and I can see if they're saying hello based on their facial expressions. But when people are wearing masks, I have no idea if they're talking to me and I, you know, I've made a lot of people pissed off in this time because I'm not looking at them when they call my name and I'm like, uh, so it has been really hard. I'm waiting for that part to be over. <laughs> However, I do feel that masks make people a lot more sensitive and aware of challenges for deaf people because people with regular hearing are struggling with masks as well. They're struggling, they do feel a barrier, they feel some sort of obstacle um, in front of their communication, which is good. And so for Zoom, Skype, virtual meetings, I would say yes, there is positivity in it. I know that back then, if I had a meeting like this, we usually wouldn't see each other face to face. It would be done over the phone. Um, and so I think that is one benefit that I do see with COVID. There are people who have that desire to see each other. Um, having a face-to-face -face conversation, people are doing that more online than they were before. I think that's good. I think that the biggest thing about COVID um, is that there are many people, not essential workers, but there are many people right now at home. And we're sitting more than usual, which is therefore forcing people to start observing, listening, tuning in to what is happening out there, tuning in to what's being shown on TV, social media. And I think that people are a little more attentive now than they were before. And I think people are starting to listen and I think it's a great time to start introducing new stories. Great. Well, I'm, it's so wonderful to meet you face to face. I hope we meet in person someday soon when we're all safe again. Uh, thank you so much for taking the time to talk with us and thank you for the important work that you're doing in so many different spaces. Thank you so much. I really appreciate talking with you, David. Thanks. Bye. Stay healthy. Bye-bye. You too. You too.